Jake Sisko totally flakes on his Dom Jock plans with Nog for Lisa Turtle. Frank and Bashir's monster lives and then dies. And Kai Wynn is now a chocolate souffle with halogen tongue sauce. My child. <laughs> hey, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with yeah. Ciroc Lofton. All right, all right. Hello. We have a <clears throat> Nog episode, ladies and gentlemen, so we are joined by very ultimately special guest, Melissa Longo. One of the is, classic Nog episodes. I don't know. Ryan, Ryan, T. Ryan T. Husk. Some say. And uh, that was like my 10th try at saying that first Jake Sisko and Dom Jot line, you guys. That's why we were kind of stumbling through it. Yeah, Dom Jot is not an easy one to get through there. I'm actually surprised you got the uh, Heligian tongue sauce. Is I mispronounced that, that one too. It's Heligian. And as soon as I started saying it, I was like, oh, I'm not going to restart. I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go with it. So everybody at home, I know I mispronounced it. It's Heligian. I don't know what I called it i think i said halogen or something like that yeah it's halogen halogen Heligi- tongue sauce yeah my child <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway so and lisa turtle was in this episode huh yeah. lisa turtle who's lisa turtle somebody uh oh first this is our review of season three of deep space nine episode 13 called life support directed by reza <laughs> A D written by Ronald D. Moore. And uh, before we get into that other stuff, I did want to make a very special note, which is that the first 13 episodes of this season were when Deep Space Nine was on its own, when Next Generation had ended and Voyager had not yet begun. And those those first 13 episodes were just Deep Space Nine all by themselves, finally with a few months of breathing room. Mm. And today we are reviewing the first episode that happened after the premiere of Voyager. So I don't know if that's got any significance, but it does to me a little bit. So this is, this is the first of the overlap, the beginning of the overlap. Right. Exactly. Okay. Mm. So when you said Lisa, I imagine that you're talking about our girl from Saved by the Bell. Yes. And I, I should have looked up her name. Do you guys remember Lark, her name? Lark oh, yeah. Lark Voorhees. Lark Voorhees. Yes. yes. She's so sweet. You know, and you know she's had, uh, she's having like a mental uh, disability issues lately. Mm-hmm. Uh, really hard ones. Um, and not the usual standard or normal things that we're used to seeing. You know, like like depression or like bipolar or whatever like that. It's not easily recognizable. It's a different one in which she can't really formulate uh, the words to express her thoughts. All of her thoughts are there, but she's not able to communicate them. It's like she communicates them almost as if she's having a stroke, kind of like, you know, like it, it, half the time, it just doesn't really fully make sense what she's saying, but you can kind of piece together what she's trying to say. And the worst part is, is that she's fully cognizant of it. So mm-hmm. she's almost kind of like in this own, you know, torture chamber of, of, you know, so it's really sad. It's really tough. So anybody doesn't know anything about that, guys, definitely Google it, look her up and see how you can help her out and support. Her mom has been like a huge support to her throughout all this. And she still looks lovely as ever. She's still super friendly and pleasant and positive. And she's being afflicted by this really difficult uh I don't know if it's a communication disease or what it is, but that's what she's dealing with. Wow. Wow. I did not know that. That's, yeah. that's sad. <clears throat> I had a huge crush on her when she was on Saved by the Bell. Yeah. Uh, you know, I thought she was like the greatest thing ever. She kind of was. Uh, <laughs> she was. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and when she popped up in this episode on this show, it brought back the memories of actually seeing her on the set when, you know, they said, Hey, this is going to be your girlfriend. I'm like, the girl from saved by the bell. Yes. I was like, yes, thank you. God. One of my prayers has been answered. Um, so it it was like a dream come true to work opposite her. And in this particular, I think you could tell in that opening scene when I'm like, yes, I'll be there. You know, (laughs) (laughs) You want to have dinner? Sure, absolutely. I'll be there. So, 
I think I could rearrange my plans. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I will diss any friend that I have to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that was pretty like, um, I mean, it was just a special thing to be able to get a chance to work with her. And I'm so sad that she told me that, that she's going through that because I, you know, I thought she had moved on and kind of went on to be a mother and, 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 you know, just living her life. I didn't realize she was suffering <laughs> so much. Um, that's, that's terrible. <clears throat> it really is. It, it seems like those those are, are really difficult things to live with because if your mind is still fully intact, but your body's not cooperating, you know, it just seems like this almost like a prison, you know, poor thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's nothing that I'm sure you would wish on anybody. Um, but she was fantastic in this episode. And so just Ray in her. Yeah, just radiant and beautiful, and I, I wish they could have kept her as Jake's girlfriend, but didn't end well. Thanks, Nog. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we just can we just address this one? I, I think Melissa already knows exactly where we're going here, but you got some explaining to do, Melissa. When when what was the line? Uh, uh, what, which which one? No, 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 no. The best one was she says he's like make yourself useful and cut up some food. And she says, you must be joking. And they all go, ha, 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 ha. And he goes, she's so dumb. I know. I was like, oh, I wish I could see Melissa's face right now. <laughs> that, was, that was one of the best lines in the movie, in this whole thing, actually. The way he delivered it was so funny. So funny. Oh, well, yeah. It was perfect. He just nailed that line, right? Yeah, he did. He nailed it. Even though he's such a chauvinistic pig, but I mean, because I thought he was laughing like, yeah, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> it was but a great no, laugh that preceded it, too. He's like, ha, 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 ha. And then, yeah. boom. Yeah. Well, yeah, the only thing that softens it is that I know that's not how Aaron thought. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, not by a long he was shot. definitely a feminist in his own right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But that was, it, he nailed it. He nailed that line. <laughs> oh, man. Did he nail that line? She's so dumb. She's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I, I, you know, and, you know, it's so hard watching this because it's like half your brain wants to say, dude, why are you saying this? But then the other half is like, okay, this is a Ferengi thing. Like, so it's like I have to keep reminding myself, you know, that this is is this is his upbringing. That this is his cultural history. This is his background. This is thousands of years of tradition, you know, for his species. So, yeah. it, and it's hard for me when I'm watching it to like separate the two. That's you know, I'm I'm constantly reminding myself. Okay, no, no, no. He's he's saying it as a Ferengi. You know, he's not saying it as a human. Right. You know, who's you know who should know better. Um, he's saying it as a person who doesn't know better, actually. And that's that's yeah. his life, right? Well, well not just that, but he doesn't even think it's better. Even if you told him to know better, he would be like, nah, you're wrong. Sorry, what were you saying, Melissa? Well, yeah. and then the fact that you find out that he even tempered his behavior because he knew that it would make <laughs> yes. everyone else uncomfortable. Which means he could have been a lot worse than he was. <laughs> he was being a sweetheart, as far as yeah. he knew. <laughs> yeah, I just said cut it up. You can use a fork and knife. He didn't yeah. have to chew it for me. Do it for me. <laughs> yeah, I I loved his performance in this. Um, it's just you know it also sh that's how much he passion he puts into his performance. You can just hear it in his voice in the way he walks, you know, um, and, and, and the way the friendship is between the two of them is pretty good because they're both are, are themselves. They're not really trying to please the other person or let me, you know, this is who I am. That's who you are. And either we're going to figure out how to make this work or not, you know, and we've chosen to make it, make it work. So that, I think that's one of the beauties of this, this friendship. We also see that Cisco is, you know, not afraid to say that he was wrong. Right. 
which is something that that's right we don't get too much of in in the show which is him admitting you know i think i brought up the line i said you were you were you said that humans and ferengis are too different to be friends right you right. said dad you you were right you know and he says yeah i remember saying that but i was wrong and i think that just goes to show you how the relationship between nog and uh you know jake grew on cisco right like that group, like he was like, you know what? That's a good guy. He can hang out with that kid, even though they have differences. And I think that their friendship is a good one and I will approve it. I think we yeah. got the first approval, right? Right. Well, and you know what? That's what makes it like a different than, than standard uh, friendship is they'll always have like the odd couple. This is done in, in so many shows, but there's usually like a commonality between them. Like they both like baseball. Or they both like this or that, or they both are engineering students or something like that. Whereas with this, with Star Trek, with Deep Space Nine, with Jake and Nog, they're like, they don't really have to have anything in common to still be friends, to still appreciate what the other person has. The only thing you had in common was that you like each other as friends, you know? And I think it's, I think it's, it's a brave way to go about it is to say look we don't need a crutch we could just say these two guys are friends and maybe we can't explain it and we don't have to kids can be friends with whoever they want and they don't think about all these other things you know mm -hmm. oh, and, it, and it's great because you can see both jake and nog learning from each other taking their cultural differences and and making a new culture with with the differences and the new friendship is aligned. And I think at Cisco admitting that he was wrong is a great example of children teaching their parents. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and Jake and Nock were a great example of teaching their parents how to right. approach different cultures and relationships and preconceived notions of what a Ferengi is going to be like or what a human is going to be like. So I think it, it's a wonderful example and they do a great job. That's right. I've said a bunch of times how like I think that Rom could have been the best dad in all of Star Trek because he was the one that let his son change him. All the others had the, the parents changing the children or teaching the children, but he was the only one that was the most open-minded to allow his, his son to change him. And this is a, an episode in the scene where we say, oh, that's right. Cisco does it too. You know, that's really cool. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, there was also a moment there, too, that I felt like uh, Nog defined himself separate from the Ferengi at one point. Mm -hmm. And the moment was when um, Jake says to him, yeah, I have a date tonight. Right. And Nog says, money is money, but women are better. Right. right? Yes. He says, is that a rule of acquisition? Nah. And he's like, no, that's a personal <laughs> rule. And that's what I mean about the personal. Like, Nog was actually, he had his own ideas, right? right. So he had his, yeah. he's like, that's that's my, my that's my thing. That might not be a Ferengi thing. Ferengi is like, yeah, drop everything for money. But me, me personally, I'm like, money is money, but girls, you know, <laughs> you know that's, that's a, better. That's a great point. That's That was our first hint that Nog was a free thinker and choosing his own path. And he was creating yeah. Nog's rules of life. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's great point. Exactly. And because, and that's how Jake follows up. Is that a rule of acquisition? Like, you know, do I need to know, do I need to remember that one? He's like, no, that's just my <laughs> own. That's how I think. Like I have my own thoughts. I am a personal, you know, that's my personal own opinion. I, I arrived there on my own. And I like that. Uh, he asserts that little in, injects that into it too, so we know that okay this guy doesn't just follow the Ferengi code you know and even like you said Melissa he softened up some of the other Ferengi things that he could have asked this girl to do which chew her chew his food and said he was you know he, he put his own little spin on it like all right let me see if you know put his own little spit on it yeah <laughs> <laughs> no no spin, chew the food spin, yeah. spin. Uh, I don't know so I thought that those were the kinds of signs for me that he was actually separate and starting to have his own like identity and, and, and be, you know, 
be himself more. I think we got a little clue into Nog's character kind of forming away from the typical Ferengi, even though the typical Ferengi things were the ones that were highlighted in this episode. Mm -hmm. um, it's his break from it that actually, you know, saw a little sunshine for me. You know, yeah. um, so there were two things that really stood out there with, you know, with the Jake and Nog thing. And that that's definitely one that, that's really standing out is that I was surprised at how Cisco addressed it, but not just Cisco. That means how Star Trek addressed this, which was we thought that it was going to be a very one dimensional answer, which is Nog's being a dick. Like this is ridiculous. It's misogynistic. It's closed minded. It's whatever you want to call it. Right. But it was Cisco that not just stops Jake, but stops all of us from thinking that he says, well, hang on, everybody. Right. This is a this is what's called a cultural difference. In his mind, he's not being a jerk. He's just doing what's within his culture. Will that change someday? Maybe, probably, hopefully. But you can't blame him for what he's been taught growing up his whole life surrounded by his regular culture. And it's funny because usually we know which direction Star Trek's going to go, but it caught me. I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. I didn't. <laughs> Thanks, Cisco. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. It was a, a good teaching moment for all of us. And I was expecting the standard, oh, yeah, that, but it, I was pleasantly <laughs> surprised as well. And it's kind of like um, Mary had suggested in, in a, one of the panels at Virtual TrekCon where, where people. Mary Chifo, right? The great Mary, Mary Chifo. Chifo. Yes. People try to tend to put human standards on a Klingon when. Klingons have a whole different way of living. So right. they're, the way they look at the universe is going to be totally different from the way a Ferengi is going to look at the universe or human. So we can't put human values on another species because they didn't grow up with those human values. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also like the insight into uh, Nog's rationale thinking like his rational brain so when we were both locked up in that cell together he started yes. to go he started to go through a list of things right and you got it was like sherlock holmes it was like, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> it's like why would this happen if my dad would be here what's going on and he yeah. was starting to break all of these things down in his head and i just like th that little insight into just how his his thought process works yeah. right very yeah. clever. So clever. He, he's a very smart individual. And you yes. can see it during that process. Yes. Yeah. I also wanted to point out that it, it, it does make, a, it's important in an actor, and kudos to Aaron for doing this, when somebody gives you a line like, she's so dumb, and you know that he may have laughed at it. We all may have laughed at it if we read it, but we all probably would have had the same reaction he did, which is like, God. That makes my character seem like a jerk. I don't like you. It probably didn't feel right to say it, you know, and kudos to him for still selling it and committing to it 100% rather than his ego taking over and be like, well, let me try to soften it to make it seem not as bad so that my character is not as bad or whatever, you know, justification we try to make sometimes. The truth is sometimes as an actor, you have to just really deliver something 100% as if you believe it, even if you 100% disagree with it. Right. Right. Yep. And well, he spelled it. A blind and thinker. <laughs> Committed. Well, and, and that's the thing about it is knowing Aaron, so I'm just, just us knowing him, when you watch it, I busted out laughing. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> but I, I wasn't... You rewound I, it too. <laughs> yeah. I, I had to see it over and over again because... It wasn't like, oh my god, this guy, what, what an idiot! Right. Why did he? I, I was laughing when I watched it because I just, <laughs> I can imagine him giving the performance. Like I can yeah. imagine him getting ready for that scene and, and saying, "I'm gonna do it like this," and you know, and and so I, when I heard him say that, I just, just was, I couldn't, I couldn't stop laughing. It didn't have the the harsh effect that it did, I'm sure, on her. The, the girl was receiving it. 
you know, but I was just laughing because like, this guy is hilarious. This is, this is comedy right here, you know, mm -hmm. because he's, he's playing it seriously. And I think Ar Armin mentioned yeah. that about drama and comedy and how he played Quark, right? Yeah. He's like, they wanted me to play for comedy, but I played for drama. Uh, right, right. Really interesting. <laughs> This particular thing, I felt like he was playing for the drama, which made it comedy, right? He wasn't trying to be funny. I, I just really enjoyed that. I just thought that was hilarious. Yeah, very good moment. So, and then there was, and of course, there was an A plot in this episode. Um, but before we get to that, let me just finish <laughs> another <laughs> thing about, about uh, this you know, Jake and Nog subplot. Um, I wonder if this episode, and without giving away any spoilers to anybody that hasn't seen uh, the next episode, probably Ciroc, um, <laughs> is that I wonder if they specifically decided, and this would be a great question to ask Ira and, and Mr. Wolf, if, if maybe they, they really wanted to highlight the differences in Ferengi culture within Nog, as well as showing, you know, just how far Nog is from Starfleet. Because as we know, very, very soon, there's going to be a dramatic change in him, or at least the first nugget of change where we go, oh, really? You know, so I wonder if it was deliberate that they really wanted to, to kind of plant the seed of look at how far he's come starting here hmm. um i don't know that that's the case so definitely they definitely reveal him to be this guy that's like completely out of touch and you know not not able to function in the new federation world where everybody gets along and everything happens right he looks like he's a little out of touch with that um but then as we'll see he begins the journey of being like you know he turns into a, the hero, and I think I think that this may be um, a starting point to show. Okay, let's let's start him from this place so we can take him up here, but we're going to bring him way down here and start him here at the bottom, hmm. or you know where he he emulates these kind of chauvinistic things and he seems like he's out of touch. Um, but I do think that they re also revealed his intelligence when they showed his rational thinking in that itself and showed how he was able to deduce what's really happening. Um, and I also like the way he manipulates Jake in the beginning when he first says, you know, oh, you have a, j a date. Oh, okay, yeah, that's yeah, great. Yeah. You know, girls are important. Yes, money is money, but girls, you know, women are better. And, and then he says, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, what's the name of my date? <laughs> right. <laughs> right and jake's like what she's like she has a friend right you know uh, and then he says unless you just rather it be the three of us <laughs> it's like like i'm going on the date with you whether there's a date for me or not so he completely bullies jake into the into the totally. getting a double date right just Which I think is the hilarious. three of us <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. the three of us and then he and then he obviously sets it up, you know, when this is this is when you knew it was gonna go bad, when he says, Don't do anything to embarrass me. Right. <laughs> There's a little foreshadowing there. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, oh God, you know it's about to happen. Do you watch Safe by the Bell? Don't screw this up for me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh Melissa, you looked like you were about to say something. Um, but we're gonna go to our break in just a few seconds here. So let's take that on the other side um so yeah uh i think that's it we'll do the trivioids on the other side which we skipped the last couple of weeks because we had better things to do and uh then we'll we'll jump back into uh this review of life support we'll be right back on the seventh rule 